Hello, today we're going to talk about some basic networking. So specifically, we're going to talk about connectivity, what the scope of a network is, some resource sharing models, and then we're going to talk about reference models, specifically the TCP IP model and a little bit about the OSI model. So assuming your network is more than a pair of tin can cell phones, telephones, connectivity requires multiple conditions. First of all, you have to have some form of a physical connection between all points on your network. And so that can be wires, that can be wireless. There's always some form of physical connection. So even your wireless network, even though the um, media is um, the airwaves, so to speak, it still has a physical connection because there has to be a transceiver um, for each system, a transmitter and a receiver. Second, each system on the network must be able to transmit inner information to any other system it might want to communicate with. Not only for the information to be able to travel through the network, it needs to specifically reach the target system. So each system on the network has to be able to talk to each other system on the network. It has to have some form of a connection to each other system on the network so that not only can it get data out of the network, but it can get data specifically from it to whatever other device that it wants to get to. And then third, the target system has to be able to recognize and act on the data that it receives. So there has to be a physical connection. There has to be a way for data to be sent out and sent specifically to a specific computer. And then there has to be a way for data to be brought in. So network components, the building blocks of the network are the node, the host, the media, data, and then the networking device. So in this picture here, let me move me a little bit. A, whole, a node is anything on a network that is um, using the network connection. So that can be a computer, it can be a printer, it can be a server, it can be whatever. A host is going to be like your server. Um, that's going to be what is sort of the main, uh, what's hosting files, what's hosting your printer, that kind of thing. Media is your cable or your Wi-Fi connection point. Data is going to be whatever you're sharing on the network, the data, the packets that are being sent among the different computers, the different nodes. And then the networking device is going to be like your network interface card, your hubs, your switches, your routers, all of those things that actually make the data move around the network. Now we have both physical networks and we have logical networks. And a physical network is, is just what it sounds like. It's the network of interface cards, network hardware, cables, um, and so on. Anything that you can touch, see, feel, hit, throw at your brother, lick, bite, that is your physical network. The logical network is how the network is laid out so um, and, and how the data moves around the network. So the physical network would be, let's say we have a network that is laid out physically in a star. You have a hub at the middle or a switch at the middle and you have your cables coming out from each of them. And um, that's a star physical. But the pathway of the data is actually in a circle. That would be called a ring logical. That's a logical network. And in other words, it's how the network is seen by the computers that use it. Any logical network has to network address has to correspond to some sort of physical device that can process it. And data is going to travel through some sort of a medium. So that means that every device on the network that is going to interface with data, that's going to use data, either going to send data or receive data, has to be have a network address, a logical address. And the data is going to travel through some sort of medium. So through wireless, through cables, etc. Now, as you are setting up your networks, you have the following challenges that you have to make sure that your network meets. It has to be available. That means we need to, to be up at all times. Uh, we want to follow the rule of five, five nines. The, the network should be available 99.999% of the time. 
We want it to be reliable. That means from end to end, the network packets are getting exactly where they are supposed to go. And in a, a reasonable amount of time, there has to be serviceability. You have to be able to get in and service the network so that you can quickly deal with any problems that come up or make it um, immune to problems. And then we care about performance. What is the speed from end to end as devices are, are sending data? Security is a big one. We don't want bad actors coming into our network and hacking into our network. So you have to set up security on your network. Scalability is important. Scalability simply means how easy is it for me, my network to grow? Can I add more computers or nodes to my network really easily? Or is it going to take an act of God to do that? Most networks nowadays are very easy to scale because of the network hardware that we use. Compatibility. How compatible are the devices with each other? And how do we deal with, um, say, one segment of the network being wireless and one segment of the network being wired? How do we make those parts compatible? And then finally, quality of service. What is the uptime? What is everything looking like that is making it a high quality network um, and hitting all of our uh, needs of our users as they use the network? So as a network administrator, you have to keep all of these things in mind as you are setting up your network, as you're managing your network, and as the network is running. So scopes of network has to do with how big is your network. We have um, small networks, as small as centimeters or meters, and then we have great big networks as large as the internet. So we're going to start with a local area network. The local area network is not the smallest network, but it is the smaller network. It is confined usually to a fairly small area, usually within a single building. It doesn't have to be a single building. It's actually defined by a subnet, a subnetwork. Um, it can have hundreds or thousands of nodes, a very complex infrastructure and a wide variety of internal services, or it can be just a couple of computers connected together for the purpose of sharing a printer and the internet. Um, the scope of a LAN means that most can be built using simple, inexpensive technology standards suitable for high performance over short distances. LANs are usually a very high performance network, meaning super fast um, because that's where our fast uh, network devices live and they're generally very easy to set up. Wide area networks, on the other hand, expand over a large area with nodes in multiple cities or countries. Um, the internet is the most common wide area network, but not the only one. A nationwide business with multiple locations might have a wide area network, such as Microsoft. They would have a wide area network. Google would have a wide area network. They have campuses all over the country, all over the world. And so they have a wide area network that expands the, uh, the world, but it isn't necessarily directly accessible from the internet. That means that I can't necessarily go right into um, Microsoft's what's called an intranet and start poking around, but it is still a wide area network. A typical wide area network operates using leased lines from a telecommunications provider which connects to the lands in each individual site. What that just means is that you're using DSL lines or fiber optic or cable um, modem lines that you get from the phone company or you know Xfinity or whatever and then they connect to the wide area networks in each of the um, offices and then in between the sites are those lease lines. They include user level connections such as DSL, digital subscriber line, or WiMAX which is a Wi-Fi um, uh, situation through cities as well as those used within telecommunications networks, such as MPLS, which is multi-protocol layer switching, and frame relay. And those are both some um, wide area network protocols uh, or technologies that send packets over um, a network very quickly. Now, personal area networks 
are networks that cover only a, the smallest area. They're the smallest of the networks. And that is, they're usually Bluetooth networks. Um, it's usually combined to your particular user's devices, such as a computer and its peripherals, um, in which case that could be a Wi-Fi network. So, or um, your Apple Watch with your heart rate monitor and your cell phone, that's a personal area network. Um, it can even use near field communication, which can be used for short differences communication, short difference distance communication between smartphones and other personal devices. But most of the time it's Bluetooth. Other scopes that you might encounter are CANs, MANs, and SANs. A CAN is a campus area network, and it's usually owned and operated by a single or organization. It kind of is like a larger LAN, but it's really more like a smaller WAN because a lot of times in a CAN, they have separate subnets. So a CAN is a campus area network. So that could be on a school, that could be in a business. Um, and it's usually the network within that, that so re the Redmond campus of Microsoft or the Snow Isle campus of Snow Isle of Muckleteo School District. A metropolitan area network is like a CAN, but it's used to connect all or part of the city. So a metropolitan or um, area network would be like London has a, uh, a huge metropolitan area network, what most cities do now, most big cities do. And they connect all of their um, businesses together uh, their uh, government offices together, as well as they have WiMAX for users to use out in um, the uh, general public. And then finally, a storage area network, which is a specialized type of LAN which connects computers to storage devices using network technology. And they're usually, it's kind of along the along the lines of a RAID array, um, but except that instead of it being connected to a computer, it's specifically connected to the network so that all devices on the network have access to it and can save to it, back up to it, whatever you want to use it for. It's a pretty nifty uh, little uh, network. So the purpose of a network is to share resources. Otherwise, we don't set a network up. There's no per there's no reason to. Um, we have a couple of different types of models for sharing resource. We have the peer to peer model, and then we have the client server model. And there's these are models that you want to use when you're setting up your local area networks. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer model, there's no central administration, so you usually don't have a server. Every host connects to the network as an equal or a peer and can offer its own resources to the network. So what you might have is you might have like 10 workstations set up as a peer-to-peer -peer network and a printer, and they're all sharing resources with each other and they're all accessing the printer. And you might even have a, uh, some storage area network, a small storage area network set up on it. And this would be something you'd set up in a small office or a home office situation because um, a client server setup is a lot more expensive. Server software is very expensive and plus so is server hardware. So a lot of times peer-to-peer -peer -peer networks are easy and inexpensive to set up. And so you would set them up in home and small office networks. They do have drawbacks. One is security. There's no centralized access of control. So there's no one server that the network administrator sits at and makes sure that every uh, uh, that only certain people have access to, to certain folders, that everybody has a username and password to get on the network and that the network is, is tied down and um, nice and secure. So that's one big drawback. The other one is scalability. With no centralized network management, you can't just keep adding and adding and adding. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that Windows 10 is meant to um, allow only 10 users at a time to access it uh, for networking purposes because it's not meant to be a server. So if you're using 15, 20 Windows 10 computers in a peer-to-peer -peer network and you have resources on computer two that 
everybody in the network needs to use. And so everybody, you know, does a UNC path name in to get into computer two. <coughs> Should they theoretically all be trying to get in at the same time, only the first 10 would be able to get in because of that, that hard coded limitation of 10 users that can access on a network at a time in Windows 10, where server, you can have billions of, of users access at the same time and have no problems. Server is highly scalable. The client server not model is what you're going to use most of the time. Um, client server model hosts are divided into two categories. You have the clients, which are usually going to be your workstations, your Windows 10 computers, and the servers. And the servers provide services. Servers would provide things like um, they can provide printing services, they can provide file services, they can provide application services, um, email services, simple network management services. There's all sorts of services that your servers can provide. And we're only going to touch on some very minor. I mean, we're getting into just the shallow part of networking in this class. There's a lot deeper stuff to get into as you go into college. Um, so you've got lots of things that servers do. In general, clients are the user's computers, whether they're simple terminals or full uh, featured computers running workstation operating systems. And then servers are specialized computers maintained by the administrators and your users do not use your servers. They access your servers across the network. So they may access it to, to um, save and retrieve uh, files. They may access it to run applications, but they don't sit down at the server and play with them. That would be uh, highly insecure. Um, a small client server network might have just one server, although that's really bad protocol. You always want to have at least two in case one goes down. While a larger one might have several, like a file server, a print server, an authentication server, um, or even uh, that controls access to other servers, or even the entire network itself. So peer-to-peer, -peer, really good for small home offices, very small offices. Client server is good for larger offices. Peer-to-peer -peer is cheaper, good for 10 and under. Client server is more expensive. Peer-to-peer, -peer, not good for security. Client server, very good for security. Peer-to-peer -peer is a decentralized type of management. There is no centralized management. Client server, centralized management. Peer-to-peer -peer actually requires a little more training of your users. So you have to train them how to access other people's um, computers using UNC path names. You have to train them how to make sure not to give out passwords because they will be accessing other computers um, through pa with passwords. There is not one single password, where in a client server thing, I log in one single time and then anything I access, Either I have a token to access it, yes, or I don't have a token to access it, and I can either yes access it or no access. I don't have to go and try and remember what was the username and password on that computer over there, or what was the username and password on that computer over there. I don't have to remember that like I'd have to remember it in peer-to-peer. -peer. So one of the things that we use in our uh, networking it, are called reference models. And reference models tell us, uh, give us sort of this idea of how a packet moves through a network. The TCP IP model is one of the models that we use, and the OSI model is another model that we use. The TCP IP model was developed by the Department of Defense in the 1960s through the 1980s and is now maintained by the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the IETF. The TCP IP model refers to the two primary protocols that are used by almost every modern network, transmission control protocol and internet control pro and internet protocol. So TCP, transmission control protocol, IP, internet protocol. It re the TCP IP model consists of a stack of four vertical layers. Each layer contains its own protocol and corresponds to certain functions of the components on the network. So here's the four layers 
of the TCP IP model. And I have also shown you the seven layers of the OSI model on the other side. So if you take a look at the four layers of the TCP IP model, we have the network interface layer, which is down at the bottom. And at, on the network interface layer, it corresponds to your network card and your media. And there's generally no protocols that hang out down there at the network interface layer. The next layer is either called the internet layer or the network layer. It just depends on who you talk to. I don't know why the IETF doesn't have that figured out yet, but it's either the network layer or the internet layer. And on the network layer and the internet layer, this is where your route, uh, your switches live. And where the protocols IP, ARP, ICMP and IGMP live. Now, at this point, don't worry too much about protocols because we will talk about them more later. But you should understand that a protocol is a way of doing things on the network. So um, ARP is, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember what it stands for all of a sudden, but it's a reverse protocol. And it is for finding out the Mac address of a computer. So if you know the IP address of a computer, you can find out the Mac address of a computer. The transport layer um, uses the TCP and the UDP protocol, among other protocols. And that's the layer at which data gets actually transported back and forth between the two um, networks. And then the application layer is the highest layer of the um, TCP IP model. And that's where HTTP, FTTP, Telnet, NTP, DHCP, ping, all the application type protocols live up here. This is where the user actually interfaces with the network. So where you would sit and play your game and your game would be doing something, where you would sit on your computer and access your website through HTTP. Um, this is where you get your, your um, uh, FTP lives up here, so you can download uh, files through here. And then if you look over at the other model, you can see that there's a seven layer, layer OSI model. We're not gonna go as in depth into this as I usually do, but you should also be aware of the OSI model. Um, the main one I want you to worry about this year is going to be the TCP IP model, but you may also run into the OSI model. And the OSI model consists of seven layers, starting with the physical, which is your networking cables and your network card, the data link layer, which is where MAC addresses live and where things like hubs and bridges live for hardware. The network layer is where switches and routers live. That's where IP addresses also live. Um, it's the same protocols, IP, ARP, ICMP, IGMP. The transport layer is the same. That's where data is actually transported. TCP or U in TCP or UDP packets. Again, we'll talk more about that stuff later. And then you have the session layer. The session layer is sort of a sub layer of the application layer. And the job of the session layer is to open a session with the other network. So if you're on one network and you're trying to contact another network, or if you're on one node and you're trying to send data to another node, you have to start a session. Uh, so what happens is a packet gets sent that's like, hey, I can send data this fast and this many packets and they're this big. And then your other computer goes, well, I can receive it this fast and yeah, I'll take those packets and I can receive data this big. And so then they sort of um, negotiate how they can send data to each other. And then that session is maintained the entire time during the whole time you're doing whatever you're doing, whether you're surfing the internet or playing a game, that session is maintained at the session layer. Then there's the presentation layer. And the job of the presentation layer is to take any data from the application layer and convert it into something that can be read by any computer or any type of node on, on the network. So if it's um, game information, it, uh, uh, if you're using, oh, say for example, a picture. 
uh, in the presentation layer would be translated into a JPEG because JPEGs can be read by any computer on the internet. And then the application layer is where the user interface with the um, network and the network, uh, it, it's got the same pr protocols, HTTP, FTTP, um, FTP, Telnet, NTP, DHCP, and ping. So that is the end of our first lecture, and I hope it didn't scare you off too much. There's a lot to know about networking, so I don't want you to get overwhelmed. Um, it is not abnormal to feel a little lost uh, at the beginning of networking. So if you do, all you have to do is just um, let me know, and I will help walk you through things. Or hang on, and it tends to all sort of come clear to you about week two or three as we go through things, especially as you do the labs and start playing around. All right, have a good day.